Hey creeps and grave hunters, I don't want to make this about me, but it is my birthday week and we are going to be ranting about one of my favorite historical events in history. Like literally I marked the year this happened the way people bur like marked the birth of Jesus. Like that sounds extreme, it is extreme, but it's how I am because I love this event, today's subject matter. Before we get into that, would you go ahead and please just kindly slaughter that Ow! like button so people can find this video and I can become YouTube famous. <laughs> just kidding, not gonna happen, but people will see the video. It will trick the algorithm. So please go ahead and like the video. It would help me a lot. And like I said, it's my birthday week. Also, if you would like to drink this week's cocktail made by yours truly, this my friends, this is the Blue Ribbon Mule. This concoction is delicious. Um, it is an American classic that I made up just now. But if you want the recipe and you wanna drink along, go ahead and pause the video, pause, and go ahead and follow me on TikTok, get the recipe, make this shabuzi, and then come back and learn about something that is synonymous with the first serial killer in America, synonymous with a torture collection, the Ferris wheel, an assassination. What could it be? We'll see you in a second. Chin chin creeps. Okay, absolute full disclosure. The opening to this, my fan was still running. You wanna know why? Because it's a heat wave in LA. It is like 10 o'clock at night and it's still like 100 degrees in my bedroom. Um, so I'm dying a slow death for you guys. So sorry about that sound and that. Anyways, moving on. The 1893 World's Fair is a big freaking deal, okay? No matter how you spin it, we're gonna get into a lot of things of why it's special, but it's just a really special time. So I just wanna like set a mood for you guys. Like World's Fairs, I think, personally, adorable, super cute, love the idea, big fan, absolute big fan. Uh, thank you, Albert Victoria's husband, for loving engineering and science and arts so much. And you're like, hey, people should celebrate together and we should be more unified. This is over in England, it's not here. They're a little bit better, it's fine. Anyways, the point is, this has been around. It's a way for countries to come around, celebrate each other's victories, advancements. It's great. Well, 1889, Paris has theirs. And my God, is it a spectacle. It is beautiful. It's incredible. Uh, number one reason, why is it so amazing? The Eiffel Tower, Gustav Eiffel, freaking debuts this beautiful pin needle in the sky. Big fan, love it. One of my favorite structures in the entire world. But flash forward a few years, America's like, we got the next World's Fair. We're gonna, we're gonna do this and we're gonna make it so great. Paris is gonna weep in their pants. Weep in their pants, moving along. We don't care. Anyways, so there's like a big battle. Like which city is going to host this super important 1893 World's Fair? And New York's like, uh, hello, it's obviously gonna be us, bro. Like we got all these things. We have, we're the biggest city. We're in New York. Everybody loves us. And Washington DC is like, hey, hey, but we're the nation's capital. And we, we, we would like, we would like the World's Fair. And Chicago's like, hey, bro. Hey, bro. And St. Louis is like, hey, hey, hello. Hello over here. Hi. Uh, we want the fair. And Chicago's like, knock, knock, knock. Hello, guys. Uh, up and coming. We just had a big fire in 1871. We're super resilient. We came from the ashes. We're awesome. Look at these beautiful buildings we're building. We have a beautiful lakefront on Lake Michigan. Obviously, we have great pizza. Uh, who cares? We're not getting... I don't know if there's pizza there. It doesn't matter. New York and Chicago get into like a battle for the World's Fair. This factoid, nobody's talking about this. You know who calls Chicago the Windy City? You wanna know why they call it the Windy City? It's not because it's windy, it is windy, okay? It's the Midwest, or storms, we all know that, okay? I've seen icicles sideways there, it's not a joke. But New York was like, that's this windy ass city. They are blowing hot air up at everybody because they are saying they can host this fair better than we can. They're a bunch of liars blowing hot air, they're windy. Windy City. How did Chicago win? A couple different factors. Number one, uh, they found the money, uh, like over $5 million, which it honestly ended up being so much more than that. So I don't know where the rest of the money come from, come, came from, probably like private investors, not 100% sure, but they have all these great architects. You have Daniel Burnham, who ends up winning the chief architect 
position. And he's kind of like this prolific architect. He's designing all these great buildings. He's got these great ideas. That's all super vague, but you get the picture. And New York just kind of has to suck it up. Like they lose because right now, America realizes we need to make a statement. What's a better statement than this city that's mainly just been stockyards and at the time of the fair was still mainly stockyards. Like they had to move stockyards for the fair, um, even though it was on the late front. Anyway, it's like 700 acres, guys. This was a huge freaking fair. But the point of my story right now is Chicago won because they had the great architect, they had the money, they had the space, and they had the American spirit the World's Fair wanted. So they had to open the World's Fair on May 1st, 1893, which means Daniel Burnham really had to like jump into work and design the, the, the grounds of the World's Fair. And he had this crazy idea. The dude was insane. He's like, I'm going to build a city. It's, it's going to have pavilions for all the countries because it's going to be the first fair where other countries and other visiting states get to have their own pavilion, not just like a stand or like a, hey, I'm here and here's my little uh, cardboard presentation. Here's my pavilion. That requires so many buildings. They had to build so, so, so many buildings. And he had this idea for like this Beau Arts city. They called it the White City. Everything was white. It was these beautiful, columned, symmetrical buildings that ended up really setting a precedent for these palatial cities in America. Washington, D.C. followed suit. A lot of the libraries around the country followed suit. City halls, uh, courthouses. Like, there's a, the reason why all of our kind of stately, important buildings kind of look this way. Think Daniel Burnham. He set a tone, and they called it the um, City Beautiful movement. Basically, instead of just erecting a bunch of rando buildings, let's have some rhyme or reason to it. Let's beautify our city. So also, they have all of these grounds. It's almost 700 acres. And they're like, we're going to put lagoons in because we want full ships because this is also the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus discovering America. So let's bring in full ships like he would have had when he came from Spain. Blah, blah, blah. So they knew they needed to find basically a garden architect to make the grounds as beautiful as Daniel was going to make the buildings. So they brought in Frederick Law Olmsted, who is just like the, this amazing gardener, basically. He's a landscape artist, and he's the one that came up with all these crazy lagoon ideas and these beautiful gardens and paths. And don't get me wrong, you're still walking on muddy roads. Like, attending that fair as a female in those dresses, in those shoes, in that weather, not a cute look. In order to build this white city, they needed a team of builders, like unlike anything else. Like they had people building this place 24 seven in all weather conditions. Like there were so many injuries, there were so many deaths just trying to get this fair open. It's astronomical. But now, okay, so now we have the buildings. Now we have this beautiful landscape artist. Um, but we're gonna need something to wow people. So I don't know, huh, crazy hair brain idea hair brain idea. Let's let's electrify the fair. Let's light it up with electricity. Let's illuminate this white city. And they did it. There was a bid to electrify the fair. So Edison is going up again Westinghouse. And Westinghouse is working with Tesla, one of my personal favorite people. And they have his amazing alternating current system. And they end up winning, F you Edison. And like a couple hundred thousand bulbs were put around the city and electrified. It was illuminated. This was amazing to the American people. Like the Paris Fair had electricity. But Parisians at that point were pretty used to electricity. Guess who wasn't? America. Guess who super wasn't? Chicago, a town of mainly stockyards. So this is a really big, beautiful deal. This event is also really interesting because they keep trying to be inclusive, but not be inclusive. For example, they decided on the like the board of managers, let's have a woman. Let's, let's, you know what? I think it's time we put a woman on this board because that could be a good idea. So they bring in Chicago socialite, Bertha Palmer, and she gets in charge of the woman's building. Huh, so shocking. And it's interesting because she really puts her foot down and she's like, if I'm going to have the woman's building, 
I'm not using Daniel Burnham to design my woman's building. I'm going to get a female architect. And he's like, no, 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 you can't do that. I'm a man, blah, 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 blah. I'm the chief architect. She's like, F you, man. I'm going to get a woman to design the woman's building because we know what we're doing. And I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. So just sit down, sir. So he sits down. And she hires Sophia Hayden, who's an MIT architect graduate. Brilliant woman. Unfortunately, uh, the building didn't go quite as planned because... I think there was a little bit of sabotage involved because she had this beautiful idea of the building, um, but the money kept uh, disappearing and things kept happening and schedules kept changing. And for some reason, her building just kind of kept getting pushed. Therefore, she wasn't able to do all the things that she wanted to do for her building. Therefore, it was less impressive. But there was an interesting thing happening in Chicago at the time when it came to women specifically. So at this time, a lot of women are moving to Chicago. Single, independent women are moving to Chicago, young ones to start a career like this is a real turning point for women because it's one of those first movements where women want to find a place in the workplace they don't maybe necessarily just want to be a wife or they figure hey i get a job as a secretary and then i meet my husband and then i can go retire to domestic life but maybe i have some money of my own a lot of women saw that opportunity in chicago so at that time in society, if a woman's kind of walking by herself unaccompanied or living by herself, she's not seen as well-to-do. If you, you could basically say she was seen as a harlot, you know, people thought they were prostitutes essentially. But in Chicago, a new term was coined for these women called women adrift. <laughs> I don't necessarily know what that means, but the, the purpose of it was to be like, oh, these aren't floozies. These women are looking for work but not in the bed like they want actual honest work these are just women adrift and what's interesting about that is in the women's building you would think they would kind of have chosen to highlight that working women but instead the majority of the exhibits in this building were things for the home cleaning domestic tasks oh look at this new appliance oh here's how you mend in darn socks this is also why Herman Mudgett, AKA H.H. Holmes, my favorite serial killer and my segue into my obsession with this moment in history. This is why he kind of decided Chicago could be a good place for me to build my murder hotel because well, there's going to be a lot of women there, single women that don't have anybody um, with them that don't really know where they are. And my God, there's great railways in Chicago and. I can just imagine with the fairgrounds, if I can get a place that's close, they'll want to take a board in my hotel and I'll kill them. So during the course of the fair, of course, Herman killed possibly up to 100 people. In total, people think he might have killed 200 people until he got caught in H94 and then executed. And yes, that is his body in the grave. They did a whole special on it. It's him. Let's relax, okay? We all like the theory that he got away. He didn't and he's in his grave. Next. So we still have an issue. What is the big ticket item that brings people to this fair? So this was probably one of the most contentious things outside of which city got the fair was what is our big thing? In fact, Gustav Eiffel even put in a bit and he's like, hello, I'm not even gonna do it. I'm not gonna do a French accent. I was gonna do a really bad one. He was like, hey, I can build an either Eiffel Tower for you guys like bigger because you're America and I can tell that that's gonna be something you guys want down in the future. Um, and they're like, nah, we're not copycats. We're gonna do our own thing. And someone's like, I can build a really tall, long tower. And they're like, nope. And that person's like, hey, I'll build a thing and then people can do the first modern bungee jumping. And they're like, what, excuse me? And then an engineer from Pittsburgh is like, uh, hello, I'm George Washington Ferris. And I have an idea for a wheel that will take humans on a circular journey. Imagine if you will, a 264 foot tall wheel that could hold about 2,000 people at once. Cars of 60, imagine the sights, imagine seeing it from above. Sure, we'll have odd, odd air balloon rides, but please step aboard my Ferris wheel. And they're like, oh, popcorn flies, popcorn flies, popcorn flies, yes. So the Ferris wheel was invented at the 1893 World's Fair and talk about an American classic, talk about a world classic now. They're all over the place. People love going on that circular journey. And it debuted there along with Guys, so many other things. The dishwasher uh, had its shiny moment at the fair. 
uh, early version of a film projector, and then a ton of bunch of little food things, juicy fruit, Cracker Jacks, brownies, cream of wheat, PBR, Paps, Wint, they run the blue ribbon, they kept the name PBR. That's in this cocktail, folks. Oh my God, it all ties together. Also, Aunt Jemima Pancake Mix and Syrup debuted there, which, uh, is a bit of a touchy subject. Yes, it is, uh, but it's a good segue uh, for this next section of inclusivity at the fair. So like I said earlier, this was the first fair to have pavilions from other countries. In fact, 50 countries came and had pavilions as well as 43 other visiting states. The Liberty Bell came, California palm trees came in. Like different people were sending different things. It was pretty spicy. Freaking Norway brought a full blown Viking ship. So they win the award of my book, but that's not true because Nuremberg, Germany brought the Nuremberg torture collection, which is 1300 pieces of medieval torture equipment in its beautiful collection. And it would sit, when it came to Chicago, it was in its entirety. And then after the fair, it went to New York where it was dismantled in an auction. <sighs> but I have seen the Iron Maiden and it's very spicy and it's at a winery. But besides that, moving on, doesn't matter. So it's an inclusive thing. They have all these different people doing different things. Um, but it's not all great and roses. So you have this guy named Sol Bloom, who would become a senator, oddly, who's in charge of entertainment. And um, there's different streets and different areas for different countries. And he's like, I'm gonna have a little street of Cairo. And I'm also going to just have a person called Little Egypt come and do belly dancing. And Little Egypt is kind of a term given to different belly dancers. I think it's a little derogatory, um, but, they danced this seductive dance to what they called the hoochie coochie. And the song is called Arabian Riff, has a couple different variations in the title, but the guy forgot to copyright it, which is why it's like the number one snake charmer song. Like you will hear it in everything. Also, I just realized my fan is back on. Damn. I'm going to try so hard to keep my fan off. I keep turning it on and I'm so sorry. It's just so hot sweating right along. Um, Little Cairo is not the only offensive thing happening here. So on the heels of them trying to be more integral, there was a section of the fair called the Midway. Essentially it was kind of the sideshow element of the fair. Well, that's the only section black people were allowed. And why is that? Well, that's where all the pavilions for more of the, and I quote, savage countries were. Obviously that's offensive. Obviously that's not okay. Frederick Douglass even wrote articles about how not okay this was. So not great folks, not a cute look. 1893 World's Fair, even in the women's building, it was predominantly, of course, all white. In that one little tiny back section, there was a little bit thing for like the African-American woman and that's it. So for fair that is trying to be inclusive on on the grand scale, okay? Like they're trying to say, come countries, come states, let's all be together. Hell, the government got in it. They're like, we're gonna issue our first commemorative stamps. Hey, let's print commemorative coins with Queen Isabel of Spain on them because yay, because Christopher Columbus and yay. And it's just kind of all bad when you think about it. And then you got all the death. Well, of course you have all the people that H.H. H. Holmes murdered and there were a lot. We'll never know the exact number. Then of course you have the people that died trying to build the actual fair. Then of course you have the messenger boy uh, who had his legs uh, just ripped right off by a train. And then you had a worker that was decapitated on an attraction in the midway. None of this is great. And then you have the funeral pyre, AKA the cold storage fire. And this thing was gnarly, folks. So imagine you're in your Victorian best. You're feeling freaking fancy. You're at the fair. We paid our 50 cents to get in here. And then we paid all another 50 cents and we're not on the Ferris wheel. And it's all great and fun. And we saw little Egypt and it's a whole thing. And oh my God, that building's on fire. So bad recreation, but there it is. 
July 11th, that's what happened. People are wandering around. They look up. There's a 191 foot tower on top of the cold storage building, which is where they kept all of the food for the different restaurants and bits and bobs and the fair. Um, and they still don't know exactly what caused the fire. More than likely it was faulty electrical wireling, wireling, wiring. Um, but that biatch went up in flames uh, pretty, pretty fast, pretty bad. So a bunch of firefighters rush in and try to put it out. Uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work well at all. In fact, 16 people in total died. 12 of them died. And that at that point was the most firefighters have died at anything, including the 1871 fair. I mean, fire, not the fair, fire. Um, and that wouldn't be surpassed until 1901 when they have their horrible stockyard fires. So this happened to bright daylight during the fair and everybody's watching it and it would have been horrible, it would have been horrific. Um, and they just let that thing burn. And there's all these security guards that are there and like police people with like bayonets, like stay back fair goers, don't get near the fire. I mean, it's tragic. There's stories of firefighters that are trying to like, they're literally jumping to their death because the, the freaking, the tower collapses and it's like a, inferno of pit of death and people are falling in people are trying to swing on ropes to get to safety they sometimes they survive other times there's people balancing on beams hugging each other telling mary sue that i love her i'm not gonna be home i mean it's just tragic it's bad it's bad it's bad it's bad and then there's the assassination of the mayor so the fair was set to close on October 30th, but on October 28th, a really pissed off dude named Patrick Prendergast, uh, he was like the reelected mayor was supposed to have an audience with me. I'm doing an appointment. He didn't give me an appointment. This is not okay. I should have a job. I should have something. I don't know exactly what was going on, but he was pissed. And so he tracked down uh, Carter Harrison Sr., the reelected mayor of Chicago, and he shot him up. Shot him dead, just assassinated him. Uh, and it honestly, not a good look, not a good look. Uh, the town wasn't feeling it. Nobody was happy. It's pretty jarring when your mayor gets assassinated. Um, so the fair had to make the difficult, difficult decision to not have a closing ceremony. Instead, they had a public memorial for the mayor. And that's how the fair ended. I also want to just point out just the random fact that the fair has a morgue. The fair had a morgue. So the ending is a little sad here, uh, a little lackluster but it's oddly appropriate. So the reason why I think this is such an important fair is because it tried so hard to be inclusive and failed so miserably, but also excelled in so many ways in advancements, in things that are so Americana, the foods we eat, the beer we drink, the rides we ride. Our first serial killer was born out of this fair. like. Nikola Tesla lit it up. It set the precedent for how a bunch of different cities look. It's a big freaking deal. And I just think it deserves more of a moment than people give it. They hear 1893, there was a devil in the white city. Brilliant book, love that book. You should read that book because it talks a lot about the fair and H.H. H. Holmes. This moment was so much more than just a series of murders, but this fair was so tragic in a lot of different ways and was on the brink of failure so many times. They were so over budget. If it wasn't for the Ferris wheel charging 50 cents a pop to ride that thing, they would have been kaput and they would not have been able to operate. They were so grossly over budget and then they refused to let Buffalo Bill come shoot him up. So he decided, hey, I'm gonna stand on outside of the fair and then charge people. I'm gonna siphon people from you and charge them to watch me shoot them up. It's a crazy moment in history. It's pure Americana. I think it's a really important event that happened here that we can learn a lot about architecturally, technology-wise, psychology-wise. It's a crazy time. We should be talking about it. Thank you guys for watching. If you want to know more about the Chicago's World's Fair in 1893, there's tons of amazing information on the internet. There's a lot of great books. I'll list some of them down below. Again, Thank you guys for watching another rant. Tune in next week for another one. Also, thank you guys for those of you who voted to say you wanted to see the 1893 fair in this episode. I really, really, really appreciate it. Don't forget, I have lots of other videos you guys can watch. So I'm gonna go turn my fan on because I'm literally sweating to death. There's a puddle of sweat dripping down my back. So chin chin, folks.